Greetings, distinguished humanitarians and cultural creatives. My name is Bruce Lipton, and I would like to thank Irvin and Maria for this opportunity to talk about new metrics in understanding human evolution. Our conventional version of evolution based on neo-Darwinian theory is a two-step process. Step one is activated by a random or accidental mutation. Step two, which is called natural selection, is expressing what is the consequence of that mutation. Does it enhance the viability of that organism or does it compromise that organism? If it enhances life, that new mutation will be carried through to future generations. The problem with this is twofold. Number one, if mutations are of random nature or accidental mutations which initiate evolution, then the question is, why are we here, becomes, how can I tell you why we're here? It was all an accident, meaning it offers no future for us in understanding about evolution. Number two, unfortunately, is even worse because that is the natural selection process, which is another way of saying uh, competition for survival of the fittest in the struggle for existence, the belief that life is a struggle. This is a misunderstanding derived from Thomas Malthus and is completely false, that in fact new science has now recognized that evolution is primarily driven by cooperation. Think about it this way. A garden is an integrated community of all organisms working in harmony. It is not a battleground. And consequently, what we're trying to do is put the garden back in the system, and that means competition is actually antagonistic to our evolution at this time. So we have to say, then, what is evolution based on? Well, we look at what is called the tree of life, which was created in the 1800s, and it starts uh, off at the base of the tree with primitive organisms like bacteria. As you ascend the height of the tree, you get more and more complex organisms, and near the top of the tree is where we find humans and other higher organisms. The relevance about this is our understanding, then, of evolution is that it represents a hierarchy of increasing genetic control that as you go up the evolutionary tree, we were believing that more advanced organisms express their advanced stages in larger numbers of genes and greater genetic complexity. Unfortunately, this whole thing has been found to be flawed. When the Human Genome Project was finished, it was found that humans have approximately 20,000 genes. This is exactly the same number of genes found in a most primitive worm called Cenorhabditis elegans, a worm smaller than a millimeter in length and containing 1,271 cells, has 20,000 genes, uh, and a human with 50 trillion cells has 20,000 genes. So evolution is not an expression of genetic complexity and more genes uh, as we ascend the tree of life. The question is then, what does the tree of life represent? Well, originally, the first tree of life was uh, actually facilitated by the work of Lamarck. Lamarck talked about evolution and increasing hierarchy of organisms, but it was based on the nervous system. And in fact, if we do look at the tree of life, it represents levels of consciousness, from most primitive consciousness found in bacteria to the more advanced stages of consciousness, such as human self-consciousness. So as we look at the tree, we say consciousness is the metric for looking at evolution. Then I said, well, where is consciousness? Well, at first we thought genes were controlling life, uh, and that's why the nucleus of the cell where the genes are found was presumed to be the brain of the cell because it was thought that genes could turn on and off. Well, this is completely false. Genes do not have self-actualization. Genes are controlled by environmental signals. This is the foundation of the new genetics, the revolutionary genetics, called epigenetics. Epi means above. So when we say epigenetic control, we're literally saying control above the genes. We now know that the environment is the source of information that controls our biology. My work on that led to an understanding of how does that environmental information enter and control the cell. This led me to an understanding of the cell membrane. The cell membrane, thought to be something like plastic wrap holding the cytoplasm together, is much more elegant than that. It's an information processor. Built into the cell membrane are proteins of two types. One's called receptors, which are the sensory organs of the cell, and another class of proteins in the membrane are called effectors, which are the proteins that engage cellular functions. Coupling a receptor to an effector protein couples an environmental signal to a biological response. So the switches, represented by receptors and effectors, are units of perception. The receptor reads an environmental signal, 
the effector translates that signal into a biological response. So a switch represents a receptor effector complex, which is the equivalent of a stimulus response complex, and in more technical terms represents an I slash O input output unit, such as a bit of data. The relevance is perception units are built into the membrane. To add more perception, which means adding more consciousness, uh, you can't stack the perception units on top of each other in the membrane. They can only monolayer. Simple point. More perception units require more surface area. So the metric now for consciousness is membrane surface area. So we look at the most primitive cells, bacteria, and when they form, interesting, these cells are surrounded by an exoskeleton, a capsule. Significance, the size of the cell is very limited by this external skeleton. A membrane can only fill up so much of that bacterium. So the relevance is a bacterium has a limited amount of membrane surface area. The first phase of evolution was to make the smartest bacterium. But once we maximized the membrane of the bacterium, it couldn't add any more membrane because of the surrounding capsule. So evolution stopped after making the smartest bacterium. The next level of evolution was a change in modality. Rather than enhancing the intelligence of the individual cell, evolution jumped by forming communities of cells that share awareness. So heterogeneous communities of bacteria got together, surrounded themselves with a membrane in a structure called a biofilm, where all the bacteria with their different functions coordinate their activities to create the life of the community. The evolution of this community led to the next higher level of cell called the eukaryotic cell, the equivalent of the amoeba. The amoeba is a specialized version of a biofilm, having all the same functions as the bacteria. But what's different is the amoeba has an internal skeleton, which allows the membrane to become much more expansive. An amoeba, which is a representative of an advanced community of bacteria, has a thousand times more membrane surface area than any single bacterium would have. So an amoeba is potentially much smarter because of the membrane. The issue about it is this. The next level of evolution was to make the smartest amoeba. The problem is this. Even an amoeba reaches a maximum size with an internal skeleton for the simple reason is this. The structure of the membrane has integrity to it that cannot hold too much cytoplasm. If there's too much mass in the cytoplasm, it will cause the membrane to rip, which would kill the cell. So even an amoeba reached a maximum size. And so the next level of evolution was now that I have the smartest amoeba and I couldn't make it any smarter, what would happen then? Evolution stopped by not trying to increase the intelligence of the amoeba, but changed paradigm now by assembling amoebas into community. And if you look in the mirror and see yourself, you say, look, I'm a human organism. I go, you are a community of 50 trillion amoebas. You appear as a new organism, but you're a community. And the relevance about that is then the human evolved as a specialized version of communities of amoebas, that the brain of the human or of mammals is contained in the skull. At first, mammals just had round, smooth brains. But when we got to the human and the skull size was limited, the brain increased not uh, by expanding the surface of the skull, but by folding and causing gyri and sulci surface area. So when you take a human brain and flatten it out, it's the surface area of the brain that is a reflection of consciousness. But the problem is this. You can only put so much brain inside a skull. So after the smartest human evolved, the next level of human evolution was not to make a smarter human, but to make a community of humans. And this is where we are right now, breaking down the old structure where humans were separated as individuals to create a new system of life on this planet, where all humans are cells in the body of a superorganism called humanity. To create humanity, we must break the existing structure, and that's what we're seeing in the world right now, a breakdown of barriers and borders. The creation of a nervous system that is global, the Internet, is what is hooking up all these cells into one giant community. What we have to recognize is that humans are now facing what is called autoimmune disease. The cells of the superorganism called humanity are fighting one another and killing one another. That's self-destruction, which by definition is autoimmune disease.
So the relevant understanding right now is the structure is breaking down. Civilization is falling apart because our civilization is based on separation with borders and boundaries between people and nations. And we must recognize that our evolution is the community coming together as one. And in this understanding, we have to recognize, yes, indeed, consciousness is the metric by which we're measuring evolution. But we have to recognize, yes, we do have a mind, but that mind is comprised of two interdependent elements. There is the conscious mind, is the creative mind, uh, and this is the one connected to our personal identity uh, and our spirituality. The other mind is the subconscious mind. This is essentially a record playback mind, a programmable mind. And in fact, the first seven years of a child's life, the brain activity is predominantly in theta, which is hypnosis. This is a period of downloading the behaviors necessary to become a member of a family and a community. But once a child reaches seven, then the conscious mind is engaged and the child then has more freedom and opportunities. Unfortunately, science has revealed that 5% of our daily life is controlled by the conscious mind and 95% of our life is controlled by subconscious programs. The reason is simple. When the conscious mind is thinking, the system is taken over by default, the autopilot, the subconscious is then in control. So 95% of the day we are playing programs that we downloaded from our parents and their programs were downloaded from their parents. So essentially, the basic programs that we're living by are not the creative wishes and desires of the population, but are the programs that have been passed through generation to generation and family lineages. And therefore, if we want to evolve, people must recognize that they're not actually running their lives with their conscious mind. They have been programmed. This is not a new understanding. The Jesuits have recognized for 400 years by saying, give me a child until it's seven and I will show you the man. They already knew the first seven years is downloading programs and the consequence of that is those programs will essentially control a child's life through their adulthood 95% of the time. So the relevance is the movie The Matrix is not science fiction, it's a documentary. We've all been programmed. To move into our evolution, we must become aware that we have been programmed, and then we have the opportunity to rewrite those subconscious programs of limitation and advance into the future. So in considering what lies ahead of us, recognize this. There is a collapse of the existing system because it's not supportive of us as individuals or the planet, and there will be the evolution of a new system where all humans from all over the planet, a global civilization, will recognize that we are the cells creating the superorganism humanity, and with that consciousness, the whole world will recover, the garden will return, and we can move into the future. But this is all dependent upon the public recognizing they have been programmed and an opportunity for them to reprogram so they can manifest their wishes and desires, which collectively would express itself as heaven on earth. Thank you.